Hey everybody, welcome to Spiritual Questions Answered. So glad to have you here hanging out with us. My name is Chris Childs, and I'll be your host. As you may have already seen, to my left is a member of our panel tonight, Cara Dom, Latin consultant for the New Century Edition. Hey Cara, how's it going? Hey, good, thanks. And then, even lefterly of that, we have Dr. Jonathan Rose, series editor for the New Century Edition. Thanks for coming on. Hey everybody. And to the leftmost, Chelsea left Odner, most. <laughs> writer for Sweet Morgan Life. Thanks Chelsea for coming. Great to have all of you and so glad to have everybody watching at home. What we do on this show is we want to talk about what you want to talk about. So we, right now, you're in the YouTube chat. What's on your mind? What do you want to talk about related to Swedenborg type stuff? Type it in. We'll grab your questions live and use them to start discussions amongst ourselves. So you want to see how it works? Let's uh, let's start. But before we do, if you've been enjoying this at all, please like and subscribe. <laughs> if you enjoyed the introductions. Yes. Uh, <laughs> this is important to click the bell if you do subscribe or else you'll never know the next time we do a lengthy introduction to some other video. Okay. Now, what, what's everybody thinking about, and what can we do to, to help uh, confuse that a little bit more? Here's our first one from the internet. Popcorn and Peanuts asks, what is Swedenborg's take on leaving this life disgruntled and unfulfilled? Ooh. So uh, let's, and let's talk about what we want to accomplish through the answering of this. So w basically, let's say that you're disgruntled and unfulfilled when you leave this life. Does that affect your spiritual condition? Mm -hmm. um, and, and or another way I could see answering that is why do some people seem to have things, you know, you go out in a blaze of glory, you know, with everybody around your bed and you've accomplished a lot, whereas other people are just kind of, uh, you know, their existence has been, you know, there's a lot of trial and tribulation in there and didn't seem like anything turned out how it should. Those are the two ways I see it, but if anyone else has alternate takes on it, we'd love to hear those as well. So wh what do you guys think? What, is, what does Swedenborg have to say, Jonathan? Well, um, <clears throat> I'm thinking of the fact that when Swedenborg describes the dying process, he says that angels uh, take great care to kind of modify our thoughts and feelings. And so, and there's only certain kinds of feelings that they'll allow us to have at that juncture. And uh, they create this atmosphere of peace. So it's sort of like in a certain way, I don't know if it really matters what you're feeling like shortly before, you know, you're feeling, ah, oh, my life was no good and I yeah. didn't get to where I was supposed to go. All that's going to be washed away at that moment of death. Not that it won't come back. But you get like a good three days off where you're just hanging out with the highest angels and feeling this peace and getting your questions answered and everything. And then eventually you'll be dropped back into your life and you can start to process some of those feelings and so on. But it's not a, it doesn't sort of fix you or, you know what I mean? They've got a mechanism for that. Yeah. You won't be haunting. people die yeah. in all sorts of different emotional, I mean, if you're terrified or whatever, you know, like they've got a way of making that peaceful for everybody. Awesome. Yeah, and some, sometimes I feel like I've heard people say that, well, and, e and in my own experience, I've had that somebody who can be very sort of grumpy and disgruntled and stuff nearing the end of their life, but then something just shifts when it's pretty close to when they're going to pass over, and just all of that just kind of falls away, and then all of a sudden they have a much more peaceful atmosphere to them. Um, and so it's, I feel like that's something people have witnessed, is no matter, there's that lower level of our minds is where all that disgruntledness mm -hmm. just can carry on, you know, waves sloshing around or whatever. But then on the higher levels of our minds, there's a level of peace that you can be, that the angels can lift you up into. I was watching a TEDx talk that was in Buffalo and the guy who was giving it was, uh, he was a medical professional of some kind who had gotten working in hospice and done this survey of the kinds of uh, experiences and dreams people had leading up to death. And it was fascinating to hear that, that what you're talking about, the, the lower level kind of pulling away, that it was very common for people to report, and they had statistics on it, that leading up to death, they would have these dreams that felt like more than dreams. And, and there was a couple of main themes. One was like, I'm getting ready to go. But another one was, I'm resolving <coughs> issues from my life. So, mm -hmm. so uh, there was a, man, I'm going to yeah, get a little bit emotional, but there was a woman who um, had a baby that had died stillborn and she had this dream of like holding it, mm -hmm. you know, and then there was another person who had had a really bad relationship with their mother, I believe, but, but the mother came and talked a little bit in the dream and in all these cases, it seemed like emotional things were getting straightened out to prepare them Just mm. yeah, right. for the journey. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. Mm. Cara, do you have any thoughts on it? I, I just, I like what Jonathan said. Well, I like what you all said, but Thank about, you. um, 
when you get to the other life, yet those days of basking in complete love. I mean, I think that has got to do a number on you. Yeah. <laughs> no matter no That's matter right. what your life has been in those whatever those three days that are that you're sort of floating before you come back to your consciousness that Swedenborg describes um, <clears throat> and then the process in the world of spirits where um, we get to be educated and we get a chance to really having shed this world's you know frenetic chaos yeah we get a chance to really find out who we really are and um, come into ourselves in a, in a true sense, I think, in a way that we haven't had a chance to before. Mm -hmm. That's the way I sort of feel it. Yeah. And I think it would be sort of typical that as you <clears throat> are, you know, your life is winding down, um, that those kind of emotions easily get stirred up of, you know, a little earlier on before you're approaching the last moment, you yeah. know, to have stuff uh, kicked up so you feel like, oh, I feel regret about this. Or, you know, you're sort of going over things in your life and everything. Uh, but I think as you actually slip into the thing itself, it it all changes. And that love fest is, uh, you hear awesome things about the, mm -hmm. yeah, the love fest, uh, which, which kind of does change your mood a little bit. Yeah. All right. Well, there you go. A couple of our thoughts on that. Let's see uh, what the next question is. Kendall M. asks, in comparison to other planets or worlds, does Swedenborg believe Earth is closer to hell or more hell-like than others? It can't be that this is one of the exemplary planets. So, for background, uh, Swedenborg does assert that spiritual life, meaning people with spirits, exist not just on planet Earth, but elsewhere in the universe. Uh, so then we can have a comparison, and w you know, how well did we do here? You know, is it is it better? Is it worse? than your average hu human civilization. I think he does say that we're more uh, outward focused than other yeah. human civilizations. <laughs> more, more superficial, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. Uh, when you put that on top, uh, a hellish, not the worst, but, but not a great characteristic, which could lead to, you know, people perhaps being greedy at the expense of others, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? Oh, go ahead. He does describe some cultures um, uh, from other planets where there's a, most of the planet is heavenly, but then there's a bad, you know, there's a bad group or the bad area uh -huh. or something like that and, and the hell from there. But uh, I, I would have to say that he does, uh, like he depicts the interaction between people from Earth and people from other planets. And generally people from Earth are not that well loved <laughs> by the no others offense. because, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we can be a little annoying mm -hmm. and... Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and so I do think, and yet Swedenborg also says in the same book, Other Planets, that a good earth person is better, you know, like the people who become, there's other spirits who just think, what good is this planet? Who are these people? You know, and then he says, well, let me show you, you know, an angel from Earth, and the angels from Earth are just so awesome. They're so unbelievable. Because hmm. I think they've been through all that kind of rugged path, mm -hmm. uh, whereas other people who lived a kind of, you know, golden age existence full of love and peace uh, hmm. are, are Buddhas, but they but they, they, they may not be savvy, or yeah. street smart right, or right, something. Right. Else. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Let's see, what was the thought I was just having? Something, oh yeah, we did a show, I think if you were to search on our library for the word serpent, something, something, serpent. Yeah. Serpent and something else. Anyway, we talk about this. It was a really great show. Hmm. But um, The serpent show. Yeah, and I think, and we, um, it was a live show that came on the heels of another show. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, we, uh, we, in that show, I think, we talk about how doesn't Swedenborg say that people from our Earth correspond to the skin or something. Yeah. Or Even. Skin, in the grand yeah. human, in this idea that everything, every part of creation is a reflection of the divine human one. And um, but it, So what's occurring to my mind now is just that uh, that different parts of the body get diseased in different ways. And they're all, you know, mm. it's... It's not good if any part gets a disease. So I don't yeah. know. I mean, 
whatever. I don't know what that means, but it just means something. <laughs> no, <laughs> Skin that, disease, heart disease. I don't know. What do you that, mean? <laughs> it, it might be that you can't have a ladder where it's like, how many points out of 10 do we score? Because we have different, uh, generally have different attributes. So mm-hmm. like Jonathan was pointing out, you can be, or and Cara, you can be pulled into this sort of superficiality that's the negative side of the the general earth mindset but then you have this potential from it too so so the skin is worried about different kinds of pathogens and ailments than the kidneys or something but you know it's not like okay it's just my skin that, that's right. that's getting destroyed right, right now so like your, i don't your care source of touch and connection yeah. or all that stuff yeah and another another interesting way to, to think about the question is even independent of other planets like which are we just closer to in a vacuum? Like, is this more like heaven is like, or is this more like hell is like? Mm. Um, and I, I would say elements of both, but, but that's mm-hmm. just a fascinating thing to think about. Well, and it's useful when you look at life and s- when you're in a bad mood and you look at life and you're just saying like, this is, there's so much that's horrific. Mm-hmm. This, it, it, this has to be way outside God's picture of how things can go or else I have some serious moral qualms with God and, and, and the whole life plan. Um, so I do find there's some comfort in, in, in that way in saying that things are totally messed up. But on the other hand, uh, it does seem like our own minds are trying to get us to think it's more messed up than it really is. Mm-hmm. That, that sometimes mm-hmm. when I look around it, it actually there's much more good than bad, but the bad is always trying to get you to focus on, well, when it's cold out, it's, oh, it's so cold, rather than, I don't have to mow the lawn right now. You know, and, <laughs> and when it's warm, it's, oh, well, it's going to get hot in a week instead of like, I, so I do wonder if it's, it's not perfect, but it isn't as bad as we, we think it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, two, two quick points, if I may. One is that I think the crime problem is worse on our planet than other planets from what Swedenborg describes it, but um, and violence, you know, problems sure. like that. But, um, and just one other little micro point is that it's specifically, I think, the, the physical senses that this Earth corresponds to. Mm-hmm. And so that's interesting because mm-hmm. we're, a pretty sensual plant, you know, like we're interested in food and visual experience and what you know, just like tactile yeah. kind of, you know, we're, we're we're like that. Whereas some of these other planets, the way Swedenborg describes them, the people f- from there are spiritual or cerebral, or you know, they're yeah. they're in a different state. They don't, mm. don't pay that much attention to the external. You know. Yeah, but they need us, or else they're gonna bonk into something on there mountain retreat you know that's right so all right so there's a couple of of scattered dots on hey the aliens and are we above or below them so that's that's the swedenborg experience yeah (laughs) okay next one this is mtp358 who asks will our interests and hobbies follow us into the afterlife Mm -hmm. how much of will we recognize who we are Mm -hmm. in there and also what's temporary and what's permanent you know, what has spiritual value versus what's just kind of a skin because we can all get a sense of i know i'm not going to have to like i learned how to keep my um car inspection up to date but i don't think i'll be doing that in heaven but will i be making food and playing guitar and yeah. what, what what is it so i'd love to hear what, what you guys think about well remembering that. just thinking of one um description that swedenborg gives in a couple of places i think um about well actually i guess maybe it's at the beginning of um married love uh because and when he see when he goes to a wedding there maybe that's when he hears about it um where he describes the day of this town this mm. angelic town and or and um and that they they work in the morning mm-hmm. and then but then in the afternoon they just have time for recreation and then they have family time in the evening and um but so now I might be combining numbers, but as far as recreation time, it just seems like people do hobbies, you know, people yeah. do things and, and they, uh, so it might be that same number. It might be different where he describes people putting on plays, you know, doing theater, playing games, having different things. And all of these activities are obviously for the mind, for strengthening your spirit and stretching your spirit in the way that we might use physical exercise to keep our bodies healthy. Mm. These are these are things that are keeping their spirits healthy. So it just seems like there's a value to that kind of variety, you know, or even going to different events to have you to think in a new way that you hadn't before or something. Got to recharge the batteries mm-hmm. too. Yeah. E- even sports makes Swedenborg's list, which is amazing. <laughs> right. <laughs> these kinds of sports and games. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. 
-hmm. And uh, I think he even uses the word tennis in there or mm -hmm. something about rackets. Something with rackets and balls. Um, yeah. Oh, better. Sports better because I still need a chance to win a basketball game. Yes. <laughs> Did I ever tell you guys a story of how I've never won an organized basketball game? <laughs> in three seasons of trying, my team I was lost. No, I'll tell you about it later. Okay. Heaven is going to correct this or else yes, I'll be yes. very disgruntled. Yes, yes. Okay. You got eternity correct. to work on it. <laughs> and something else that Sweden works First of all, I think that the answer would be a yes that um, – our interests and hobbies do follow us into the afterlife. You know, the things that are sort of imprinted on your heart. And so you, you just love those things. But Swedenborg also says that those kind of things turn into things that correspond. And frankly, I find what he says about a little difficult to understand. Yeah. Uh, like, okay, train spotting here equals what, uh, you know, I, I don't know what that turns into, but I can imagine all those things have some kind of spiritual component that have the same mm -hmm. delight in it. But it may not be collecting stink bugs. It may be collecting the spiritual equivalent of stink bugs or something. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Lady whatever bugs. people's yeah. hobbies are, you know, yeah. what spiritual stamps are or, or whatever in a telepathic world. Yeah. I don't know. I was thinking of that same thing that, that turns into the pleasures that correspond. And, and at times it seems obvious that, oh, yeah, like, you know, if you have a, a joy in like cultivating earth here, that could turn into cultivating things in the minds of people. But but it also seems like you're, there's still people who are gardening. So yeah. where does that drop off? And I feel like there's got to be, speaking of sports, you think about, you see um, when there's a, you'll often see there's a kid who has some kind of terminal illness or something. And for one thing, a young kid, and what they want to do is they have like a favorite basketball player. And you see like a picture of him with the basketball and he's like, I got to practice with the team. This is so cool. It's like a you know heartbreaking situation, but there's something about getting to see the essence of the hobby that you love. There's got to be something of that on the other side. Like people that had really treasured something, it's like you get to meet Super Mario or something on, on the other side. I don't know how that fits in, but part of me feels like there's got to be that emotional resolution of you get to like dive into the essence of instead of just pretend, instead of just pretending that you're whatever kid you know whatever kids play dungeons and dragons or something you really go on a quest you know like mm. look, there's got to be some kind of <laughs> yeah. living that out right so, yeah right i have no swedenborg to back that up but there's gotta <laughs> be okay Sounds, seems like it. yeah well swedenborg says that love is eternal and so it's an interesting question um uh, at what level are the loves of our hobbies and interests i mean like i love music and that seems like something worth loving. But one time I remember feeling like, oh, not even that is spiritual because it just feels good. Like, you know, you can feel this yeah. vibration when you're humming. And, yeah. and that's all it is. It's just a physical. So it's probably yeah. going to go out the door <laughs> when I die. But <laughs> I'm not laughing at your grief around that. It just, you just were very distraught. I, I could tell. Was. Yes. It was a distraught moment. But, but anyway, so I just don't know. I don't know. What are the levels? Of love that's an eternal love and a non-eternal love and is it is it why um why you love it you know like what does that drag it on uh, we don't know this yeah. is the kind of thing that we don't get these nice clean easy swedenborg answers to which makes for great wondering you know after the people ask the questions but and we were we were just uh talking about this or at some point talking about memory and how our every no it was in a news from heaven episode yeah. you were talking about memory and like that nothing is lost and it's all mm -hmm. there and mm -hmm. i you know so i recently got to play tennis with my son over the weekend and i haven't played in you know well over a decade or more but it was so much fun like it was like this deep memory of how much fun it is to play tennis just came right back and mm. like there's still so much delight in that and there's got to be a spiritual origin to why that feels like, why should it feel delightful to be just hitting this ball back and forth across yeah. a court, um, you know, running and whatever. It was just great. And, um, but so something about how there's a purpose to all of those memories that we build up. And then we do get to like, the Lord wants us to experience the joy of getting to be in those again or revisit them or however they end up feeding into our time in the afterlife. But like, whether you whether I would get to play tennis again in this life or if it weren't until the next life, that's still there just sort of waiting for a chance to like bring mm. you some more joy sometime or something. Yeah. Well I'm, that I'm having the, the thought that I, I wonder whether the passion actually increases. Yeah. <laughs> like Carr is gonna love music more. <laughs> right. You know, because yeah. in some ways Swedenborg describes the flesh as actually kind of limiting 
our that's, access to the feeling yeah. that is underneath it. Mm. And so I think it may increase rather than sort of washing out, you know. Not too much in time. I mean, I don't, I don't really have much of a bucket list, but I have a huge after the bucket list. No basis in Swedenborg at all, yeah. that, as far as I know. But I can't wait to be a carpenter and a cello player. Yeah. And, you know. yeah. <laughs> right, right. You got you're like, okay, well, I'll fit you in in 400 years. That's right. But I'll get there. <laughs> That's right. yeah. And maybe, Chelsea, what you were saying made me think of Swedenborg claiming that all our states of life return af- yes. after death. Right. It's, it's yeah. that, that that tennis state was in you there, yeah. and if you hadn't been playing with your son, it wouldn't have come out. But do we revisit all that and that would include the the joy of hobbies and mm-hmm. All, right. Mm-hmm. all right well great question thanks so much let's see uh what else is in store for us here tacitus asks after jesus died one of the gospels says that deceased saints came out of their tombs and walked around and talked the swedenborg believe that really happened can you really have these people reconstitute their body is that a oh. literal uh description of a miracle what do you guys think? Yeah. I, I uh, happen to read what Swedenborg said about this. He does talk about it. And he says that if you look carefully at that passage, it doesn't say Jerusalem in there. It says the holy city. They, the, um, and partly what he's saying is that actually what's described there is, yes, that really happened, but not in the physical world. Because mm-hmm. people don't come walking out of their physical tombs in the physical world. The holy city was not Jerusalem. It was a spiritual place. And souls, we did a show about the right, souls the under the altar and, and, and that kind of thing. That, that people who had been stuck in these spiritual states for a while that got liberated by Jesus' resurrection uh, came out and appeared to many in the spiritual world, in the holy city, yeah. Not in the physical world. And yet the way it's described, it just sort of, yeah, okay, mm, next thing. You know, and it's describing physical things. Yeah. And then it says, yep, and the tombs were opened, and the <laughs> saints appeared to many. But it doesn't say who. It says just to many. It doesn't say whether they're angels or people or whatever. But um, that's the Swedenborg's way of handling it, which I think is very interesting. Because otherwise, that's really like, wait a minute, Swedenborg said you can't. You know, you're not going to be reconstituted in the physical flesh and come out of the you know come out of the ground come out of the yeah. grave and and all that stuff so and would you want to if we're here saying is this planet is a lot like hell why is it why are we coming back here <laughs> hooray there's your reward oh, yeah. come out of your cave yeah he describes one scene where people were people who actually had that belief that they'd be resurrected in the flesh after they died were asked so, do you want to go back in the flesh? And they just run away screaming like, oh, no. No offense no. to the flesh. Right. Right. No, they're not as interested anymore. Awesome. Yeah, other thoughts? I think that pretty much says it. That's what I was yeah. thinking. And I just know that I think it was the, the live show that came after that show on the book of Revelation, Souls Under the Altar, that we do talk specifically about graves because there is this lining up of tombs and graves and right, the right. pit and the all this biblical the, language yeah. that that Swedenborg is writing about how that does um, its meaning a spiritual state yeah. that we can go through. Yeah, that's right. And so it's similar to what you read in the epistles of how uh, Jesus went down and and freed the captives and all that sort of, you know, lifting people up. It fits better with that when you understand it's not a physical yeah. yep. thing. It's something the Lord did in the spiritual world. Well, unless lest anybody think that Swedenborg is all too refined for the woo of miracles. He does say miracles did literally happen. Yep. But, but, <laughs> but he says they didn't just happen out. So not that particular one, but other things like the things that Jesus was reported to. He said that stuff happened. Right, like Lazarus or something. Yeah, but but he says it happened through an orderly system. Like mm-hmm. there is a way in which, yeah. in, under the right conditions, the spiritual world can affect the physical world. And yeah. it's not just magic suddenly existed then didn't exist. So, um, but so he he's not all like no nothing like that happens. It mm-hmm. does, mm-hmm. Um, but but not right. in that instance. Thanks for asking. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. This is from Jen Blossom. She says, if my father died thirty <coughs> years ago, does Swedenborg give a reference as to how long that would be <laughs> in the spiritual world? And I find this, it's confusing sometimes, it is, yeah. hearing him talk about time in the spiritual world. He certainly seems to toggle between saying there's no time <laughs> and then using lengths of years and days to describe the time there. And you can't tell, is he just using how long passed on earth? 
in between that stuff or how long it would see the rough roughly experience equivalent mm. so does, do you guys have any mm. uh answers he does seem pretty loose with just being willing to say they've been in this part of the spiritual world for 20 centuries yeah like, okay <laughs> Right. Okay, that means nothing. <laughs> we need a frame of reference here. Yeah, right. yeah or even talking about this uh, after people die, that they have these three days before they wake up. Or I think there's somewhere that he says most people, they don't hang around in the world of spirits longer than, say, 30 years. Exactly, yeah, he says that too. Yeah. Uh, but but, th- but then he talks a lot about how there's no time and space in the spiritual world like we experience it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah he... Um, and he'll even say that events that occurred in the spiritual world, like one guy touches the the Bible when he's warned not to, he touches oh, the yeah. edge of the paper and he's thrown in the corner and goes unconscious for half an hour. Swedenborg will say, you know, <laughs> well, you know, like yep. why, what, what's, how yeah. do you get a half an hour? You know, are you sure it wasn't 35 minutes or something? Okay. <laughs> and he will anchor events in the spiritual world to specific moments like June 19, 1770 in this world, yes, or right. 1757, the Last Judgment, or, you know, and so it 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 seems like they he gives you the impression they run in parallel in, in, in some sense. I mean, there's yeah. some meaningful mm-hmm. way that he can say this happened on December 13th, 1759, you know, and at eight o'clock in the evening or something, you know, he's describing right. a spiritual Is that experience. Daylight savings time. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I can certainly see them them running in parallel, uh, or, or that it's it's now, right now, here, and it's now, right now, there. So let me complicate it a little bit. He does talk about days and years in that people go through cycles of states. Mm-hmm. That's true. That you have a nighttime kind of state when you're falling out. There's no way that he's talking about uh, for two, 20 centuries is, you know, all that time in terms of spiritual years where you've gone through your spiritual summer. Mm. He's probably just approximating earth time, mm-hmm. right? Right. I don't know. And as far as the question about wondering, like, so where is her father after 30 years? We got so caught, I'm oh, sorry, I totally forgot that was yeah. the question. We got, <laughs> so we got caught up with like the mechanics versus the human story here. Okay. Right, but that is, Thank I you. do wonder, like, I mean, I just think there's these stages that we go through after we die where we're and it, that's sort of like to each his own as far as like the spiritual processing of like when you're going to be going into your deeper natures or feeling like you're going to be spending time in the more outward elements of your memory or whatever and then before you're moving on so but i do think that um yeah like you said people don't 30 years in the People don't often spend more than 30 years in the spiritual world as, as world, of spirits. Sweden, yeah. world of spirits. What Swedenborg says there is like, um, yeah, I do think it's uh, if there's any sort of willingness, likely it's likely that within 30 years there would be you'd be ascending to a certain point, you know, yeah. or like you're not. Right, the, the stuckness or something, you know, like probably a lot of work has gotten done. Between in, 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 in that fact, time. in right. in Swedenborg's earlier works, he talks about thirty years, and then later on he talks about twenty years. Like the time has gone shrunk mm. already in the time that he's been doing it. Budget and cuts. I tend to think that the <laughs> the people who spend a lot of time in the world of spirits are people who are pretty complicated or conflicted or you know like they had a lot of sort of spiritual therapy to do or something Uh, i think people who uh uh, are are pretty good-hearted like rise up pretty quickly but that doesn't mean you're not going to see them like they they come back they come into that state and join you after you die and everything so some people think oh no i I've, i've heard of partners who when the partner dies and they've been gone for 20 or 30 years they think oh no they've gone on to Heaven without me, and that means they've married somebody else. Or you know, they got yeah. all tangled up in that. Oh no, I think that you know, uh, I, I wouldn't worry about that. I think you're going to see each other, but I imagine they've uh, found their home by now mm-hmm. because the processing is pretty quick these days, from what he describes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> these days. Yeah. Right. 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 You know, Recent they advances. They yeah. got some good people up. There. They have a new director of something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. And what, something I think about. They got the internet, so it goes quickly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did they get that from us? The, it seems like though the um, in the the question of like yeah how f- how far separate is this person who's, yeah. who's been gone for thirty years makes me think of in near death experiences a couple accounts I've read where the person says they are tra- they're traveling or they go have some experience with a being of light or something and they say I couldn't tell you if that was a few seconds or a mm. hundred years yeah. like I yeah. right. and multiple people it's a very strange 
way to describe any experience, but yes, multiple right. people say that independently in their experiences. It makes me think that w- that because if I thought you you know one of you was going to go for thirty years to to another country and I wasn't going to see you for then, I would think, wow, yeah, you're going to be a whole different person. And also, right. if I thought I wasn't going to see somebody for thirty years, um, I would, that's a so long. But I wonder if for the people who are in spirit. It's even though you're going through every moment, it's there's no sense of the drag. It's like you're going to be right here. Like uh, I'll be right here, ready for you in 30 years. And even though that could seem like any amount of time, there's not the same distance that builds up because of the passage of time. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right, right. Yeah. Okay. Well, hey, there's a couple of thoughts. Thanks so much for the question. We're going to take a little um, a little travel here into hearing someone else talk about Swedenborg. Um, so this is this is a segment we've been doing the last couple of uh, panel shows where we like to hear, we call it a guest story, we like to hear from somebody about why Swedenborg is important to them and how it fits in. And we've just been talking a lot about uh, near-death experiences and, and their, their cousin's out-of-body experiences. So we have our, our guest today is Marilyn Hughes, who she actually runs a website called the uh, Out of Body Travel Foundation or outofbodytravel.org. And she's appeared in a couple of our programs. Um, and I got to ask her about two things. One is like how she's r- reporting having experiences just like Swedenborg did. And I said, so how, how is that apply to your life? You know, when you, you come back and what do you do? But then also in, she has this sort of like these, this line of study you can take. And in that line of study, she recommends everybody to read Swedenborg's Heaven and Hell and his book Married Love or, or Marital Love. So I asked her, yeah, what, what's your out-of-body experiences done for you? And why those two books? And this is what she had to say. The way it unfolded for me, it began very simply in the beginning with spontaneous experiences, out-of-body experiences, that um, uh, where you you would just start learning with uh, things like how to move around in the spiritual uh, realm. You had to learn how to see, how to hear from the consciousness rather than from physical organs. You have to learn how to move in a a different way because you're moving through thought. In the spiritual experience, you're learning how to, you know, navigate and travel through the multi-universe, which is a series of realms that all overlap one another. And yet they're also very different vibrationally um, in terms of the higher you go, it's, it's a much higher, finer frequency. The lower you go, it's, it's, it's less so. And the lower you go, the more weighted your soul is. The higher you go, you can't go unless you discard weight from your soul. And it affects your life profoundly in pretty much every way because it ends up um, guiding uh, your journey here as well. You know, the experiences are going to show you how you um, how you need to proceed forward in this world. Um, it's going to show you things that you need to see, which ironically is... Uh, one of the things that relates back to Emanuel Swedenborg, Emanuel Swedenborg seemed to have a very uh, profound understanding of energetic truth is the word I use for it. <laughs> he had other words for it, but he had this ability to see into the spirit world and understand what things were from God's vantage point rather than from our limited one. And that's what these journeys have done in my life is to give me a much broader perspective of what's going on around me. How am I going to make my choices based on what things really are versus what I might have thought they were? You know, a lot of souls cross over very confused in terms of what reality really is. Um, And again, that takes you back to Swedenborg and why his works are so important. Um, because what Swedenborg does for us is he allows us to see our physical reality here and what's happening on the ground from the standpoint of how God sees it and how it appears through the lens of virtue and vice um, in a way that we are not able to do without the assistance of the Holy Spirit. And Emmanuel Swedenborg did that in such a profound way in his writings. That's what makes it so important. Swedenborg talks about that a lot in Heaven and Hell, the the deluded states that we can all be in when we cross over. And that's one of the great gifts of that particular book (laughs) because um, it it allows us to see through so many lenses um, the various ways that we could 
enter into a state of you know delusion self-delusion or delusion that comes from the world itself that could really trip us up in this life and the next in ways that um are really you know not good for us that would take us backwards and that um are just not a good thing for us to do um and it and it allows us to reevaluate the way that we're thinking the way that we're viewing things it gives us a uh, you know a window into our own souls as to where we might be where we might not be seeing things more clearly just wondering yeah why why heaven and hell and then why marriage love why do you feel like if okay. you're start if, if you're starting um people on Swedenborg, why, why are those too important? I do recommend both heaven and hell and marital love in the course of study that we offer on our website for free for people to take. And the reason that we do that is uh, we'll start with marital love. Marital love is um, the only book of its kind written in the history of humankind. You know, when you're reading marital love, it literally alters the energy of how you perceive your own marriage and how you perceive marriage. And I've seen this happen, not just with myself and my own husband, but with hundreds of other people, because I recommend it to everybody who's having marital problems. And I do not recall a single one where reading marital love did not completely save their marriage. <laughs> you know, even if their marriage was imperfect, they were able to recognize where their imperfections lay and work on them, but also understand there's a greater picture going on here. You know, when Emanuel Swedenborg talks about how marriage is, uh, you know, occurs in this world and then how it transitions into the next and how the married couple, if they are truly living together in love and wisdom and light together, become one angel is something that uh, only Swedenborg has described. Heaven and Hell is truly like one of those essential texts. You know, um, Heaven and Hell is something that I think every human being should read. And if they don't, I think they're missing out on a lot because what Emmanuel Swedenborg really accomplishes here in ways that go beyond anything you can experience Plain. You have to read it and experience it to fully understand. He takes us into not just the overt things about our character, um, but he goes into all these subtle aspects of everything that we may be struggling with. And he shows us how that looks in the spirit world. And it is, I can, you know, as a mystic too, I can say that is absolutely how it appears. But what Emanuel Swedenborg's Heaven and Hell really does for every one of us, it takes you into every possible human interaction, human problem, big, small, in the middle. And it, it literally is a dissection of your soul where you can take it apart and put it back together in a way that is more pleasing to God and that will be more pleasing to you in the end because we always forget that what is pleasing to God is always pleasing to love itself, which is what we're all seeking. We forget that those things that we don't see clearly are not things that we carry with us because um, they're just goods in themselves. They're not. Um, we carry them because we think they're good. Um, we don't even often recognize the negative things that are happening or the things that will continue to happen or will happen down the road, even in eternity, as a result of things we refuse to look at. Um, we, we don't recognize that what is underneath is, is, is more important than what is on the surface. So heaven and hell is just an essential text that everyone should read. I mean, it's like an essential text of humanity. If you want to understand what is your purpose here on earth, what am I supposed to be doing while I'm here in this world? You know, it's kind of confusing at times to people because it's, uh, you know, we're here for a short time. We know that it's temporary. What are we supposed to be doing? A lot of people feel this confusion. This is the sort of thing we should be doing. 
is taking this because we're trying to make ourselves over in the image of God. And that is what Emmanuel Swedenborg's visions were always about is understanding what things are from the standpoint of how God and the higher heavens see them. And we want to know that because that is highly educational for us in our human spirits so that we can move higher and hopefully move closer to God and his will for us. I love doing that interview. I was so pumped up by her description of heaven and hell and marital love. I was like, oh yeah, right, those are cool books. So, um, uh, Cara, do you have any uh, reaction to it? Yeah, well, uh, her point at the end there about how just the deeper levels in us are so much more important than what's on the surface. And um, that is such a basic thing that that is going on in Swedenborg that I forget sometimes that people miss out on that yeah. message. So to have heaven and hell be, be a central reading for every member of the human race, I thought that was an interesting point. Yeah, yeah so just that perspective um, that those books and that Swedenborg's works can give on ourselves and our spirit versus our bodies and our minds and get those levels differentiated. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Other thoughts? Oh, it was really great. The, the idea of the uniqueness of marital love on the planet ever, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. like such a unique book and particularly in that idea that two people become one angel. Uh, that was very cool. And also that what's pleasing to God is pleasing to love itself, you know, <laughs> like it's so well put, yeah. you know, it, it, it's a, uh, uh, so I loved her, her clarity and her idea of a God's eye view that you get through these books. It's just a beautiful way to put it. Yeah. I like, um, I really do think it's been having a bigger sort of transcendent concept of marriage has helped me, you know, so much in my life and, um, and in my actual marriage. And so like, that that is something that i've had the you know fortune of just growing up with so it's just cool to hear her recognize that and really it's like a perspective that i wish just anybody could have because it can feel so you know when you're just down in the nitty gritty of life if you don't have a bigger picture sense of even even not even thinking of whatever your relationship you're in, if it's marriage or not, but just a bigger sense of like God as marriage and then how then we get to participate in this thing and everything. I don't know, it just gives a lot of great perspective. So that was he great to hear her talk about that. Yeah, I think m my favorite thing that she said was, as you pointed out, Jonathan, the God's perspective on things. It's not when you go through the books, it's very obviously Swedenborg's perspective. Like he'll make statements in the first person and I noticed this and did this, but uh, there's a reason why I can always jump into any part of the writings and get this certain sense of relaxation. And mm. I think it's because while Swedenborg is, the, is narrating it, the, what, what is valued and why it's valued and the reason we're talking about the things, all that is, I would say, God's perspective and that mm -hmm. it, it's always about how can we bring everybody towards heaven more. It's not, um, it's not competitive. It's not ego-based. That there is, that's the part of the brand of it is this, and I, I'd never thought of it like that, but I liked how you yeah, put it, God's, yeah. God's perspective on it. So that's why I think, you know, a lot of people can like fall asleep to hearing Swedenborg right. stuff because it's, you just know there's going to be nothing, uh, you know, most of the time there's nothing that's really at, out of step with, with divine love and all that. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much, Marilyn. And thanks uh, to everybody who's been typing their questions. And in the meantime, we're going to get mm -hmm. to one right now. Matthew Bush asks, can you guys explain mm -hmm. discrete degrees or degrees of height? I'm reading Divine Love and Wisdom and nice. trying to wrap my head around it. Thanks, and kudos to you for going after Divine Love and Wisdom. We are going to do our best to help you out. And I've, I mean, there was a Swedenborgian I was talking to recently who s said that discrete degrees are the most important thing yeah. in Swedenborg. I've heard that more than once. So <laughs> what the heck are they and why? And why? how could something so boring sounding mean, a, mean right. something so important? <laughs> what, what is the... What is the thing it contrasts with? Discrete continuous. Oh, yes. continuous. Discrete yeah. and continuous. Yeah. So what's Agreed. continuous Go ahead. degree? Yeah. So, take it, Cara. Take no, no, I'm not going to Well, take let me, okay, let me see if I can get it right or wrong. Continuous degree is we're going up a ramp, and now we're at the top. Mm -hmm. And so we're halfway up, and we're three quarters. It's just you wouldn't even notice if your eyes were closed how high up you were. Discrete degree is like 
you're on the first floor of a building, you're on the second, you can't get through, you can't get to the edge of one, and then suddenly you're in the other. They're, they're, uh, there's some kind of barrier in between them. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's right. Um, so an uh, example of a continuous degree would be like temperature or other things that you were mentioning where it just gets warmer or colder, but it's all on the same continuum. Uh, but the discrete degrees or discreetly different levels, uh, it's almost like if someone said, can you fit your chin in one of the hairs of your beard or something, you know, uh, it's, no, you can't like it, it's it's and even that is on the same physical level. But uh, it's like, yeah, quantum physics versus classical physics, you know, like something right. that describes. Yeah. Anyway, keep going. Right. That. that uh it is like the physical world and the spiritual world, which to me is the easiest way to think about it, but not an easy way. But, but the um, idea that there's a completely separate, like the mind and the body. Now, people get confused about the mind and the body, too. But I like the idea. It helps me to think that the mind is one thing and the body is another thing. And if you see a, a body of someone who's passed away, their mind is not there anymore. You know, like it feels like something's gone. And... and um, uh, so that relationship of two things, but you can't get there from here, as you were saying. You know, it's, it's like the jump from the flesh to the spirit. It's not just, well, if we get on a really high mountain or that mm. foolish idea mm -hmm. in the Old Testament, you could build a tower to heaven. You know, that's dumb because heaven is not just sort of, no, another hundred feet. I'm yeah. sure we'll get there. <laughs> no, you don't. It's all around us and you don't get there mm -hmm. by just going, going on a continuous degree. It's a discrete degree. So and I don't I, know if that I guess I wonder, me. does he, well, what's coming to my mind is you think about um, like electron orbitals around a molecule like i'm mm. trying to think of like what would be a useful way to think about it and like an electron can orbit an atom or whatever at a certain energy but if it gets enough of an energy it goes boom and it goes into a t an entirely different orbital and then it's on this other level and then it'll go shunk and it'll go back down and it'll shoot out some light at that yeah. point um but so like <laughs> those are these discrete little levels that you can only exist on one level with a certain kind of energy and you can't, and then if you're, if you, if your energy changes, you're going to be at a different level. And I am not remembering now if Swedenborg, I mean, he describes the levels of heaven as being discrete yeah. from each other. And, but then he says how the levels of our mind reflect the levels of heaven and have these discrete differences in them. So the usefulness of discrete degrees for me hmm. is that um, it's not just a big mess in there. It's not like <laughs> there's just <laughs> crap. I'm stuck in this room. Yeah. Somewhere there's some good people. There's a lot of bad people or yeah. like mean people or whatever, like thought influences or whatever. But that actually there's these levels of my mind that are discrete from each other. And I can learn to tell the difference between them and that the sort of hell influence is only going in on a certain level and there's another level mm. that is discreetly different from that first one that other thoughts are coming in and I can connect to those thoughts and mm. though that they don't mix like oil and water. You know, I don't have to be, a, you know, I know I'm on one level and I can be safe there even if there's the whole racket going on on the other level. Um, but so then that just keeps going as far as like inner levels of our mind that are corresponding to the levels of heaven. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good good example, if I can jump on the end of that, uh, that um, in your thinking, when you can look down at your own thinking and say, what am I thinking? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a discrete level. You don't get there just by thinking more and more and more and more, more. You're looking from a higher level down on your thought. I remember hearing someone who was laughing, laughing really, really hard, actually, and then instantly stopped laughing and said, uh, oh, I wish I felt fully involved with my laughter. And like, so there's two different things going on. You know, there's like laughing and laughing. And then there's another part that goes, I'm not really 100% in this laughing. Yeah. And the first opportunity I get, I'm going to say, you know, just in the interest of honesty, <laughs> that I'm not really fully engaged with this noise that's coming out of my mouth yeah. right now. Yeah. And people can look at themselves and go, listen to me. What, you know, th this is ridiculous what I'm saying, you know, or something like that. Mm. Well, you can only do that through discrete degree. It's not, it's non-continuous. 
Yeah, I wonder if we are helped in terms of thinking of heaven as a discrete degree different from earth by the pop culture idea of dimensions. Like mm -hmm, this, this mm -hmm. is in a different dimension. That, yes. it, that, that wasn't readily accessible in Swedenborg's right. day, but everybody knows, oh yeah, that thing phased in from a different dimension in Ghostbusters mm -hmm. or something. That there's, there's a place that you don't get to by going really far this way, really far this way. It's somehow inside. You have to have a portal or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I don't, I don't think this is what that question is, but I'm... There's a couple of things that I want to say that are like levels related, but I don't know if they're discrete degrees right. related. But I remember, I think they were in Divine Love and Wisdom. Well, that, that one that when he says like these, these discrete degrees, or, or maybe it's levels I'm thinking of, think of them not like um, something stacked on top of something, right. but like one level is a cell. Another level is tissue. Another level is organ. Right. Mm -hmm. That you have, those are like the different levels mm -hmm. and that when you have the first level of your mind open, it's like, okay, your, your organ, the, the liver is, is functioning well. But when the second level of your mind is open, it's like all the different tissue is each one is functioning and then the, all the cells are open. So you get this more and more. And then just recently I was reading, I don't think it was, it must have been Divine Love and Wisdom. Maybe it wasn't, but it was talking about how the heavens are discrete degrees apart from each other right. and that when he's describing those, maybe levels, maybe discrete degrees, he says that he says the continuous is just like you're going up a mountain, but the but the discrete is like cause and effect, and yeah. that and I was yes. looking yeah, at sure. a um, water draining into other water at the time, just like a faucet on in the sink, and you should I, turn that off. <laughs> I I I couldn't because I I had to think about this thing, and I was like I was like wait a second. <laughs> so it's like the inmost heaven is where that water is hitting the other water. And the spiritual heaven is like the sound coming out of that. Because mm. those are two different things. You know, the, sa oh, the sound the waves coming out. Yeah. Yeah. Is that like, and I don't know how to apply that to places where people live, but that kind of, like they're re obviously related, but they're totally different things. So mm, yeah. I don't know if that's Ooh, exactly which, what you're talking about. And you can think about, about that in terms of like sound coming in and hitting your eardrum, but then going into being this vibration yeah. in the bone and then becoming an electromagnetic yeah electromagnetic signal yes. like or that's or a kind of cool <laughs> levels thing i actually was like okay so one level is the cilia in your <laughs> ear one level and and but this will be like the most earthly heaven or so yeah but so anyway we should do a video about that sometime. Yeah. and part of what's <laughs> in what you're saying is that the as, as swedenborg says the the higher levels are much more complex and have much more in them so i i think in some places he'll liken the outer level to like a whole rope and then there's the fibers that go up to make the, mm -hmm. yeah. you know and then there's the microfibers that are in the fibers yeah. or something it's that kind of thing where right muscles and Cur stuff. current translations i think render that um distinct levels rather than discrete degrees right don't, don't mm. you yeah think? and level levels is definitely the word in the new century edition for okay. degrees we usually talk about levels because i think, I think it has that idea of kind of yeah, yeah. Know, sort well, of and, vertical like that and because we uh, don't really use that word discrete so much in no, english these days no we're yeah. getting less Distinct, and less discrete as a culture dis distinctly <laughs> different going on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this has been the nce minute <laughs> well but when you were talking about the uh the many the the many uh the the, the complexity on the celestial or, or heavenly yeah. level it is weird that he, Swedenborg is like the opposite of Power Rangers. So there's a kid's show that was big when I was little where you've got all these these heroes have their robots that they're in and when it's really time to really do something, all the robots stack together and you get one yeah. giant robot out of it. Yeah, and you might think right. spiritual ideas are like these little things, but when they all go together, a bunch of them make up one celestial idea. Mm -hmm. But it's the opposite. He mm -hmm. says right. there, are, there are so many celestial ideas inside of spiritual, which is just like there's so many cells inside your hand that's just it's sort of counterintuitive mm. you, you and think. it's against uh, atomism you know the idea that you could reduce everything down to some lump and there would just be a little lump there and what we found in it's modern more physics more is that yeah. more and more complicated <laughs> the there's smaller, a whole world yeah. that yeah, yeah yeah you keep dividing yeah. it it gets more intense not less it's not just sort of you know if you took your couch apart or something there'd just be lumps of stuff in there you know but my you, couch you yes take, <laughs> but you take the physics <laughs> Uh, you know of of matter and it's 
unbelievably complex what's to going quote, on. There. To quote Fern Gully, there are worlds within worlds, Krista. Uh, <laughs> can't you feel it's pain? It's a lot of, a lot of 80s references. I know, I know I've heard music before, and that is not music. <laughs> Fern Gully, I, I love okay. it. Okay, hey, so that question got us super hyped. Thank you so much for it. Let's, uh, let's do another one here before, before the end of our program. Michael Bravo asks, in one of your episodes, Swedenborg mentions the last mm. days. Mm. What do you mean by that? Mm-hmm. That sounds biblical, doesn't it, Jonathan? It does, Cara. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the last days. Yeah. The, I think he is echoing biblical language where in the Bible a lot you'll read phrases like at that day or in that day and all these descriptions of big powerful things that are going to mm-hmm. happen, you know, mm-hmm. upheaval and beautiful things and difficult things and everything being overthrown. And, and um, so I think he's referencing Christian ideas, and there are ideas like this in, the, in mm-hmm. Islam and in Judaism and other religious traditions, uh, but the idea that there will be some big... Um, time some cataclysmic events uh, kind of thing now Swedenborg sees those very differently than uh, other people do he, he thinks that he's in them and they're going on spiritually and it, and it's a it's a change in the way the mind works and the amount of freedom you have and not sort of like everybody's running out of gasoline or something you know yeah hmm. makes me think of um, yeah stages of cycles I uh, Recently, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I had a blog post on the Swedenborg Foundation website. <laughs> Check it out. A circle calendar. Um, and, it was good. Uh, but about just thinking about cycles and somebody, somebody's response to about it help was like, because I was thinking about that there are four seasons and there's this like fourness to things. And, um, and there's four. So Swedenborg talks about there are four times of the day where you have the, right. you know, um, you know what they are. Anyway. <laughs> he, he loves Let's say them us, together. Yeah. <laughs> yes, right. Um, There's but, midnight. No. So, <laughs> so, um, so the. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's let's okay. take our breath and listen. <laughs> being trying to wade through these things for an hour straight, you start to get yeah. silly. Okay. Get, get. But, but last Go days. Yes, That's last it. Days. Last um, days. That it cycles through, and so the last days is when one cycle is coming to an end and a new one is beginning. Uh-huh. And with the fourness of it, um, uh, there's a number in Swedenborg where he talks about how that lines up with the four churches that right. have been, and that that's these. So whenever, I just love that even even in even in angelic terms like death means a new beginning you know and mm. night means the dawn like you just there's no time mm. that you're in the end nice. days or the end right. times or the last days where you're With not the, actually at the beginning the, of the next thing mm-hmm. you know and so there's just like that's what these last mm. days are mm. all the time are just these cycles that we're going through and we can go through them in big ways like he describes the new church being right coming this beginning after the Millennium. end yeah and then but also just like we're here in springtime because the winter just ended and yeah and time times and half a time is a reference to three and a half which is sort of the lord stopping before it gets all the way bad like he mm. he starts it up again quickly after three and a half mm. rather, let, oh, rather so cool. than letting the whole four right. run the out four. or something so. right you've already started before you think it's ended yeah something. yes I think That's right. Unless w- those times were shortened, no one could be saved kind of thing, right? Mm. That sort of thing, yeah. <laughs> well, we're in the, f- the four of this show right we're now. The four, this yeah. is okay. we, we've, we've gone through a progression, and uh, I just want to say I really enjoyed it. <laughs> I love just getting to uh, – oops, I keep tapping the table. Um, <laughs> I love just getting to think through this stuff and, and have new ideas pop in, and I just want to say thanks to all of you for asking the questions and great questions and giving us the chance to to think through it as well. Hopefully you've been enjoying the programming here. And if you want to find a way to help this kind of programming continue to exist and spread out through the internet, here's a little clip about what you can do to help this move forward. We want the ideas and insights we cover to be available for free to anyone, anytime they need them. That's why we offer Swedenborg's books as free downloads on Swedenborg.com. And we share all the content on our Off the Left Eye YouTube channel with no paywall or ads. The only way to keep this up, though, 
is for those of you who like what we're doing and feel comfortable giving to give. If the idea of helping others have easy access to the content we produce feels meaningful to you, please consider supporting this cause with a donation. You can go to otle.causevox.com and follow the prompts to give a one-time or recurring donation. We'd be honored to have you become part of our growing community of supporters who help these ideas reach and nourish thousands of people every week around the globe. Give if you can, receive if you need. If we cycle through this way, in the end, everybody wins. Thanks to everybody who has supported us and continues to support us. It's, it's, uh, we can't say thank you enough for it. It's what made this whole thing possible. And as part of a thank you to all of you, we're going to be launching something very cool starting next Monday. Chelsea, do you want to talk a little bit about what wow, we're getting into? Yeah, so yeah. as on April 1st, we are posting the first episode of the first season of seasonal content of Swedenborg and Life. And so, mm. um, and sort of... And it'll be with this first episode, The Secret to Changing Your Life Story. The whole season um, is asking the question, can you change your life story? And so every episode um, tackles with that theme in some way or another. And you can stay tuned because we're going to be posting a seasonal, a channel trailer for the season um, on the channel, I think, as of tomorrow, or you can find it later this week for sure. Yeah. Um, and this will be the beginning of a new sort of regularity to our Monday night offering where we'll have a Swedenborg and Life show that is part of the season and then a Swedenborg and Life live broadcast um, where it'll be Curtis and Jonathan exploring some uh, biblical question of some kind and then followed by a, a Q&A show. So and then back to another episode in the season. In case any of you were wondering, as we began 2019, didn't you guys used to do a show that was like a little shorter and, and like you would go and do videos and stuff? Well, we yeah. haven't forgotten those. Yeah, right. We've just been cooking them. And yeah, what we're going to be coming out with is this this set of four that one leads into the other and we can really explore a whole topic. We're going to look at your life story. It's going to be a great time. And uh, we, I want to say I had a great time tonight. Thanks to all of you for coming you. and and, uh, and chatting. And to all the rest of you, we'll see you on Monday for the brand new season. And we'll see you on Thursday in News from Heaven. We'll see you Saturday. We'll see you all the time. All the time. And we wouldn't have it any <laughs> other way. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Swedenborg and Life Live is Curtis Childs, host and showrunner, with co-host Jonathan Rose. Live stream tech and graphics by Stuart Farmer and Matthew Childs. Show writing and chat moderation by Karin Childs and Chelsea Odner.